Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new feature on my YouTube channel, at least for tonight. I probably will do more of these, and I have spoken about this story before on my live streams, but I wanted to go back and try to remember as many details as I could, write down some notes, and then tell you guys what happened. This happened back in 1996 and my first ex-wife and I, I have two ex-wives, not seven as some people on Twitter have suspected. And the first ex-wife is a natural psychic. And we somehow found out about these workshops or classes that were taking place about an hour north of Tampa in Florida where we were living. I think it was Newport Ritchie where the house was where we went for these workshops and Newport Ritchie's on the West coast of Florida. It's Southwest Florida. And both of us were interested in UFOs and metaphysics and belonged to the same metaphysical church in Tampa. I don't remember how we found out about the workshops, but they were run by an older woman named Maria who claimed to be a psychic. I never had a reading with her, so I don't know, you know, if she was legitimate or not, but besides Maria who owned the house, there was another person at these workshops and his name was Isha, which was not his real name. I believe Isha is like means word of God or something. And you could look it up. Maybe I'm wrong about that. It's I-S-H-A or I-S-S-H-A. And I believe his real name was Manny or Victor. And his big claim was he was a Palladian walk-in soul. And basically what that is, allegedly, of course, is this Palladian soul enters the human body and replaces the human soul. And then the human soul goes off to the Pallades and parties for the rest of eternity in his or her new Palladian body, the old switcheroo. So that's basically the premise, the souls switch bodies. Uh, and by the way, Palladians from the Pallades star system, they're human looking blondes, uh, just like the Billy Meyer case, which most people realize or believe is BS. So those are, those are the alleged Palladians. And did I believe that he was a walk-in soul? No, but I heard about this. I don't know. I can't remember what I heard, but I wanted, I probably heard about it at my church, my metaphysical church. And so I wanted to check it out. I'm like, all right, let's see what the guy's all about. Something new, something different, a little road trip, an hour north of Tampa. So yeah, um, and I was new to the subject of UFOs not too long before that. I mean, I had some interest when I was younger, but this is when I really started diving deep. Not too long before these workshops, I had really gone down, down the rabbit hole. I had really gone down the rabbit hole and um, was reading so many different books on UFOs and related subjects. So I was getting myself up to speed. Um, and at the time, this was 96. So Bringers of the Dawn, which was written, was written in 1992, and the follow-up book, Earth, in 1994, they were written by Bar Barbara Marciniak, who supposedly was channeling the Palladians. Uh, so those two books were very popular around 1996 in the New Age community. So it's kind of like, you know, I heard some guy was a Palladian walk-in soul and I had already heard about these books. I'm like, yeah, let me check it out. Palladies, Palladians, everything. It's all the happy ETs, the human looking ETs that are here to help us. So I said, what the heck? So we went to the first class. I think it was $15 each for the class and maybe 15 or 20 people showed up. And something I'll never forget we were told to bring a snack, some sort of dessert. And that turns out that the snacks were the best part of the workshops. 
because some people went out of their way and went the extra mile and made homemade desserts that were really good. Um, and this one dessert, 26 years later, stands out in my mind. Somebody made this German chocolate cake that was so damn good. I remember taking home a piece. I'm like, can I please take some of this home? So, yeah, that was the thing I remember most about those workshops. The workshops were good, but that cake, oh, my God. So the class featured all of us sitting around in a semicircle talking about different subjects related to UFOs, and Isha would lead the discussion, and other folks would chime in with their thoughts and experiences. Uh, my ex and I mostly listened since... You know, you're new to the group. You don't really want to talk too much. And to tell you the truth, I don't remember if I did chime in a lot. I just don't remember. What I do remember hearing for the first time was about the Denver International Airport and how it has this public art, these murals that are connected to the New World Order. And it's showing the future and how they're going to control us and put us in these concentration camps and I've been to the airport. The, the art is weird. It's very, it's very dark and features children in coffins. It's not really something you would expect in an airport, but I don't think it has anything to do with our future under the control of the new world order. And some of the information was coming from in the class. These two young women were supposedly using a Ouija board and coming up with information on the airport and how it was going to be used in the future and blah, blah, blah. And then another thing that Isha talked about, which I found interesting, first time I ever heard this was he said some of the intelligences behind UFOs feed off of the negative emotions of humanity, which since then I've heard it from Tom DeLonge. And then in the past, Rudolf Steiner wrote about it. Carlos Castaneda wrote about it in his books. Other folks have written about archons, you know, and then we have Paul Eno who does amazing work, who I'd love to interview hopefully soon. He talks about we're dealing with parasites who are feeding off of our negative emotions. So yeah, the ideas are out there, but I first heard about it in 1996 through Isha or through one of the classmates. I don't remember exactly who said it. I don't know if any of that is true about our emotions. I know a lot of people think it's crazy talk. But I find it interesting. And, you know, our thoughts can affect random number generators. Um, so maybe there's something tangible there. Maybe our thoughts are edible, tasty, negative human emotions. Um, but I seem to remember Isha also claiming, and this is when we start getting into some territory that really raised my eyebrows. And Isha claimed, and like I said, I'm trying to remember this. I could be wrong, but I think he claimed that he rode on Palladian spaceships and he was taking pictures of other Palladian spaceships from one to the other. And he had these really great pictures. Um, and they were really clear whether or not I'm remembering that correctly. Either way, as far as taking a picture from one craft to the other, I'm not positive. I think he said that, but either way, he did say he had pictures of UFOs, Palladian spaceships, and he showed us the pictures, lots of different pictures. And I just remember looking at them and thinking, those are really cool, but they're probably too good to be true. Um, I also remember thinking, um, sorry, I'm, I thought, I thought they were too good to be true, but We also still enjoyed the classes. You know, I'm like, all right, these are probably fake, but we enjoy the class. So let's keep going. Especially since at the end of each class, he would lead us in these guided meditations for about an hour. And we would chant, oh, as a group. And it was really powerful. And we also had meditations where he would lead us and try to get us to access our previous lifetimes which I was familiar with at the time. I'm pretty sure I had read Many Lives, Many Masters by Brian Weiss. So, you know, let's try to connect with our past life, reincarnation, you know, and after both of those type, types of meditations, we would go around the circle, and if you wanted to, you could share your experience, which I hated doing. Uh, maybe, maybe 
you didn't really have a choice because of the peer pressure. I, I seem to remember not really feeling like I could say, pass, I don't want to talk about it. Although I think you could have. Um, so that was, but those meditations to this day, those are some of the best guided meditations I've ever taken part in. Fantastic. So there's nothing negative I could say about that part of the class or even most of the class. So anyway, we were going once a week and we went maybe five or six times. And then somewhere along the way, I started noticing that people weren't questioning anything Isha would say. Whatever he said, whatever he claimed, nobody would bat an eye, nobody would question it. And me, of course, I had questions about a lot of things. I probably kept it inside because I realized nobody was asking questions. Uh, but, and I'll get, I'll get to the, the thing that pushed me over the, over the top in a second. Um, one class, somebody claimed they received telepathic messages that the UFOs were going to show up at 11 PM or midnight. I don't remember what it was. I remember it was late and it was a work night and I really did not want to stay, but I'm thinking, you know, if I leave and they have this amazing sighting, I am going to be pissed off. So we stayed. And I'm like, what the hell? Let's see if we see anything. And what we saw was absolutely nothing. Now, the people next to us were like, oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, what the hell are you talking about? There's nothing there. Of course, now, present day, I've heard, you know, stories and allegations that the intelligence behind UFOs can affect perceptions our perceptions and make one person see a UFO and the next person not see the UFO. Supposedly the manager of Bass, I'm thinking that was Colm Kelleher, had spoken about how you can't tell if somebody really saw a UFO since they can affect our perceptions. So you have to measure the human readout system, which is the immune system, to see if there was any effect on the body. So if they both had, a, had some sort of effect on their body, then they both were you know, in front of the UFO. But that doesn't mean they both saw it because it can affect our perceptions. So anyway, do I think that's what was going on with Isha and the people in the backyard who were claiming to see UFOs? No, I do not think that's what was going on. What I think what was going on is they were just trying to make Isha happy um, by claiming to see UFOs. And then, you know, they didn't want people to wait around for two hours and then not see anything. So to make sure people didn't feel like they wasted their time. They were saying, look, UFOs, UFOs. A lot of these folks had problems in their personal lives. And I think they were attracted to this type of class and leader in the hopes that it would help them better themselves. You know, he was going to help them better their lives or themselves. Just like, you know, when you go to a metaphysical church or when I would go to a metaphysical church or any church, you would see people that you're always going to get people who are going through a rough patch in their life and they're, they're searching for something that'll change things. So they gravitate towards a church or, or an organization or a group that they think will help them. Once again, I was having questions about various things that Isha would talk about. My main question, I, you know, my main question was your photos. They look ridiculous. And I didn't say it like that to him, but I did finally. I'm like, I got to ask. I got to bring it up. I said something, something. I had a question about his photos, and he reacted really defensive and really negative. Right then, I pulled my ex aside, and I said, you know what? I don't think we're coming back. I didn't like that response, and I'm the only person that's asking any questions. And his response was not good. I'm sorry. And I also remember thinking at the time, this feels like a cult. You know, I didn't think it was a cult. Not at all. You could come and go as you please. But the fact that nobody questioned Isha, that was really bothering me. And when finally somebody did, me, he didn't like it. So I don't remember what my ex said, but I'm pretty sure she did not put up a fight. And so after that night, we never went back. Now looking back, it was a great experience. I don't regret anything about it. I do remember speaking to one guy about my feeling of it being cult-like. I don't remember if I used that word, but he was not receptive to it, so I just dropped it. Now, if I could go back in time right now and speak to those folks, I would say, 
listen, you need to get away. Deception is never okay. And what's going on here isn't a healthy relationship between Isha and the group. You know, elevating someone to guru-like status has gone on in the UFO community for decades. And there's various people who are selling their information. They're selling their information, their classes, their excursions. And some of those folks make a lot of money doing it. I'm not going to name names. You know who I'm talking about. There's some of the bigger names in the UFO community. Uh, When Lou Elizondo talks about demolishing the UFO community, I think he's referring to the problems caused problems caused by people like that um and their fans and followers believe everything they say without question and defend them to the death on social media what they'll say is listen my guy has the truth but even if it's not all true i really enjoy his material and his videos and i've seen that up close i've seen somebody watching something and i'm listening and i'm like you do realize this is nonsense right and they'll say oh i know i know but i like it it's enjoyable so it's like there's really nothing i could say when somebody says that now there are also people online who have had multiple identities multiple accounts and engaged what i feel is they engaged in what i feel is deception by inflating or making up their credential credentials lying about who they know making up stories that serve to placate a certain faction in the ufo community those folks also have their fans and their fans refuse to question them at all and i, I use fans lightly uh, supporters uh you know they have people who like what they talk about they like you know what they represent and but these people will not question that person and it's it's disturbing to me to see that and some of these folks don't take money so what's their purpose in deceiving people i can only speculate that they get some sort of fat satisfaction out of fooling people i don't know you know i can't get inside i can't get inside this i cannot get inside the head of somebody like that because i i can't think like that because I'm really honest. I, I, I don't deceive people and I can't imagine somebody just doing that. So it really bothers me. You know, and, and if you talk to the supporters of some of the folks who engage in deception, they'll say, well, my experience with that person has been very positive. You know, that person, their information really helped me. I do get that. I get it. But some folks will just refuse to admit that they were fooled or they were duped or they were lied to or they were lied to. And I I understand people have their own personal experiences that may be positive, like I had with Isha and, you know, I enjoyed the class, but there are other people being deceived or manipulated. And and in some cases, emotionally damaged by the deception. And to me, and I would think to everybody, that's never okay, never. So the classes that I went to, if somebody said to me right now, hey, Isha's having a class tonight. He's in Vegas and he's given a two-hour guided meditation. I would probably pay 20 bucks one last time and just go for the meditation. Just one class. You know, so I understand where some folks are coming from as far as, you know, they still think positively upon a person who I think is engaging in deception. But my advice to anybody who follows those folks would be, Stop following them and don't communicate with them. Uh, If they're deceiving people, that's not okay. And if you can't question their background or their qualifications and get proof about their claims, that's not a person you want to be around. Sorry, it's not. So that's my story. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, Like I said, I don't regret going to those classes at all. I'm glad I did it. I'm also proud of myself for being the only person to ask a question and question his photos because if you guys had seen these photos right away, you would say, those scream fake. Uh, I think he had them analyzed later and strings were found attached to these probably models. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I'm pretty sure. So... There was a guy, Randolph Winters, who wrote a book, The Palladian Mission, 
I think he covered Isha a little bit. Um, also, Randolph Winters wrote about Billy Meyer. Like I said, most people feel that case is BS. And then there was another giant red flag, which at the time I didn't realize was a red flag because I didn't know him. But Sean David Morton, who just got out of prison for fraud, you know, for defrauding people, he wrote an entire article article in his newsletter about Isha. And at the time, I didn't know who Sean David Morton was. And I didn't realize he was not credible, to put it, light, to put it lightly. Um, you know, this was 26 years ago, and I, I had just did my deep dive into UFOs. So I was really naive about a lot of stuff. I believed almost everything I read, including a lot of channeled books. I had zero discernment. But even with that naivety, I didn't believe the guy was a walking soul. I didn't believe Isha was a walking soul. And I also didn't believe the photos. And, you know, all of that was fun to think about. But that's that's not why I went to the classes. I went because I was just curious at first. And then, like I said, fun to think about until I realized deception was going on and people were being duped and money was being made. Um, I think a few years after, maybe maybe not a few years, maybe a year or maybe even several months after we attended, stopped attending those classes, I heard Isha had changed his name to Archon and he was on some European speaking workshop tour um, with Maria. I seem to remember hearing also that it did not go well. So take that for what it's worth. My advice, just be careful who you get your information from. The next live stream I'm doing is Sunday, if all goes well, with uh, Chase Williams, the man who leaked Wilson Davis on to Imgur a few years ago. And then I'm gonna also, also will have Michael Vi with me, which those two guys are going get, to get along really well. So I, I we're going to cover a lot of ground. I also want to cover the work of Bill Bankston, who does work uh, healing mice of cancer. It's It's amazing to me that with all the data Bankston has, it gets ignored by people in the UFO community because healing is just, you know, a bridge too far for many people. But, you know, a lot of people in the UFO community are pissed off that other mainstream folks and scientists ignore UFOs because, you know, they won't even look at the data. They won't even look at the reports. Well, they're doing the same thing with Bankston, but Bankston has a ton of data. Lots of laboratories around the country. He's done his studies with the rats. Not rats. Sorry, mice. He's done his experiments with mice with cancer. And I have zero doubt that the mice are getting healed using his method, which I will. I need to do a whole show on. And I, I will do my best to interview Bankston. So many interviews I want to do. So much. So little time. You know, limited time. Because I also do my blog. And I also do Twitter. If I just did YouTube, I could do interviews all the time. But... I think the blog is important, even though it takes me forever to do a transcript, which I'm working on Nolan on Tucker Carlson, which the transcript is taking forever because I add so much to the transcript links and different excerpts that pop into my head that are connected to what the person is saying. So yeah, so I need to do more audio like this to update you guys on what's going on in the UFO community. Right now, people are claiming there's big information, UFO information coming out next week. I haven't heard anything myself. Some folks think it, it's Ross Coulthart's new documentary, Australian former 60 Minutes investigative reporter. He has a new documentary coming out, and supposedly he might have interviewed somebody in one of the legacy UFO programs. I would hope it would be the crash retrieval program, but that's speculation by everybody involved. Whitley Strieber has said he also heard, you know, something was coming. Various people said something is coming. All right. Well, I don't know about it, but I hope something is coming. We'll see, though. I want to see another 60 Minutes report where, where they touch on crash retrievals. I also want to see an, another New York Times report where they actually get to put in their article what was taken out last time in their 2020 crash retrieval article where one of the writers involved was livid after the editors took out the meat of their article and they were working on Wilson Davis. So one last thing, Eric Davis has worked for multiple decades chasing down the crash retrieval program. When he was on Michael Schmarconish's show on CNN, Mellon basically said, yeah, you know, he was, Mellon was asked about retrieval of non-human craft. I don't remember the exact wording right now, but Mellon said, yeah, 
Eric gave them enough information that that should be taken seriously. So now it's in the NDAA. So they need to take Eric's information. They got everything they needed from him. And now they need to go look and decide if they do find the crash retrieval program, which I believe they have on good source, my information, they have found the crash retrieval program. um, But what they do with it, how they get that information out to us. I don't know. That's up to the, to the new office, the new UFO, U, the new UFO office. That's up to Congress. And I hope we get to hear some of it. I know, you know, we're not going to hear the whole thing. You know, we don't want to, sh- you know, tell our enemies if we tell our friends if, or if we tell us, you know, the American public. So I understand that, but the fact that we're not alone and we have a craft and we have bodies, allegedly that information, if true, needs to come out. So I will, I will try to do short updates like that, and I'll be on camera for those. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the story. And like I said, any questions about this, tune in Sunday. I think it's 4 p.m. Central, if I'm remembering, but I'll be on Twitter. And I'll, I'll make a graphic tomorrow. You guys can see on YouTube the timing and everything. Should be a really good show. Chase knows a lot of stuff about a lot of things an experiencer, some really good sightings. And Michael had his sighting in the Gulf, uh, Persian Gulf. I think it was 92, so they can compare notes. Talk about some Lou Elizondo stuff. Chase went to TTSA back in the day. Some really interesting stuff. I had a, a nice video chat with him the other day. So anyway, all right. Hopefully you guys have a good night or a good day if it's tomorrow. I will see you on Sunday.